Seiko, good afternoon. We're thrilled to be presenting a timely webinar entitled Warrior Lawyers Documentary Discussion. This panel is sponsored by the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice and is one in many of a series of rapid response webinars. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit the AmericanBar.org CRSJ for updates on these programs. Before we begin, we have some welcome remarks from Deborah Enix Ross, President of the American Bar Association and Senior Advisor to the International Dispute Resolution Group at Devaboys Pimpton. Hello, I'm Deborah Enix Ross, President of the American Bar Association. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this special event to celebrate Native American Heritage Month. Let me thank the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice for its work to help our members mark this important celebration and for all it does throughout the year to promote equity and justice. The contributions of Native Americans to our national fabric are profound and lasting, and the law is no exception. The ABA is proud of our affiliation with the National Native American Bar Association to help us exercise our national voice for the profession as we identify issues of concern, fight for justice, and celebrate our successes together. And we are thrilled that ABA President-elect Mary Smith, a member of the Cherokee Nation, will serve as president of the nation's largest and most prominent organization of lawyers and legal professionals. Our vibrant member-driven organization could not serve as the voice of America's legal profession without you and your participation at programs like this. If you're an ABA member, I thank you for your support. And if you're not an ABA member, I encourage you to visit ambar.org slash join and consider joining us. And here's another request. On social media like LinkedIn and through your professional connections, please spread the word to your colleagues, especially to the young lawyers and law students you know about your experience with this webinar what you have learned, and how your involvement in the ABA enhances your work and service. Thank you all for your continued outstanding work and dedication that makes our legal system strong and committed to equity and justice for all. Thank you, President Ross. Um, during today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A function. So please don't actually use the chat function. If you could use the Q&A function, that would help us manage questions best. If you do not see the controls, please ensure that your screen is not idle. I will be monitoring the Q&A and we will do our best to address these questions, um, time permitting. We will be sharing a recording of this program with everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. We will now watch the trailer for um, Warrior Lawyers. One of the reasons that I wanted to be a Native attorney was because I wanted to be one of the warriors, one of the Ogichida. In our culture, the Ogichida are the warriors. They're peaceful warriors that stand up for the people. Every time I think about being a lawyer and why I went to law school, it always comes back to my earliest days with knowing a bunch of, um, of my relatives who were Indian people. Many of them didn't want to talk about it or denied that they were Indian. If they could pass for white, they would do that. They changed their last names. They refused to speak their language. Becoming a lawyer is just one of the things that I felt like I could do to help to remedy that. 
Askipagash Gigido Indigenakas, Waganakasing Odawakwe, Mashike Indorum. I just introduced myself to you in my native language and in my in English that translates to Greenleaf Talking, Askipagash Gigido, because when I speak, I speak for my people. I am an Indian woman from the land of the crooked tree, and I am a member of the Turtle Clan. And I'm very honored to serve my community as the chief judge of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. All rise. My evolution personally as a judge is, I do think about justice as being sacred because of the gravity I feel as a native person in the service that I perform in a native community to try and help other native people to live the kind of life that they ought to live, you know, as the Creator would have them live. A lot of people think peacemaking is a soft way of getting out when in fact you have to tell the truth. It's harder. The adversarial system is so focused on punishment, retribution, winners and losers. And the peacemaking system is focused on healing, on empathy, on relationships, and on addressing the underlying causes of what brings people to court. Part of our interest in peacemaking um, had to do with our interest in using restorative justice practices and models to interrupt the school to prison pipeline. Well, we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. 25% of the prisoners in, in the world are in United States prisons. Think about that. We have 3% of the population. There's something wrong with that system. There's something wrong with that society. So uh, a restorative concept of justice is something we could learn a great deal from. Indian communities make very hard decisions and people who can understand kind of all of the effects of those decisions on, on the tribe itself, their relationship with their state government, their relationship with the federal government, their relationship with the community members can really, I think, be invaluable to tribes. And that's what Native lawyers do. As we come back, um, you know, I, I'm sure that many of those watching this panel today have watched the um, Warrior Lawyers documentary. And for those who have not, I would encourage you to log on in the next couple of days and do watch it. There's a lot of meat there to digest. Um, and this panel will either serve as a, as a cap on the, on the front end or on the back end to that. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce each of our panelists um, or let them introduce themselves. Um, we are honored today to be joined by Audrey Greyer, who is the executive producer and director of Warrior Lawyers, Defenders of Sacred Justice, and she is also the founder and executive director of Visions. Um, Audrey, do you want to introduce yourself and, and let us know a little bit about how you got into making the film, perhaps? Yes, well, thank you to everybody who is, is watching and participating today. Um, I am the filmmaker. Um, I have a little bit over 20 years of experience as a um, video producer director, and I also have a master's in social work from NYU, which tends to really um, influence the types of topics, the social affairs topics that I like to focus on, particularly um, when it comes to um, communities and cultures that are not represented in the mainstream media. I guess what brought me to this a particular documentary to, to focusing on Native American issues, especially in the light of the fact that I am not Native, um, two, two really major reasons. Um, I, at different points in my life, I, I discovered sadly that I knew almost nothing about Native American issues. Um, and and I, I just was, um, as I started to learn something, be it through a class 
or someone I happened to meet, such as Warren Petoskey, who did the music for this documentary, and discovered um, that I didn't know the basics, that the boarding school system existed. Um, you know, it, it, it shocked me. And so when it came to deciding upon my next um, topic um, as a documentary, I um, decided that it should be on Native American issues, not only so that non-Natives can learn more about these uh, critical and important topics and how they continue to affect contemporary society, but also because I wanted to be able to participate in presenting these um, well, role models to Native youth. So those are really the two driving factors behind why I chose to do this project as well as my first documentary, Our Fire Still Burn. Thank you, Audrey, that, that's super helpful. And, um, you know, I also just, Thank you for um, being an ally to to our communities, and it, it really takes somebody. Um, it takes voices from within, but also um, outside to to get this out there. So, so thank you on on that front, Audrey. Um, next, we'll go to um, Judge Michael Petoskey, who is the Chief Tribal Judge of the uh, Patagon Band of Potawatomi Indians. Well, I'm not sure what I should say about myself other than, you know, I've been a tribal judge for almost 40 years and I've worked with five different tribes uh, here in Michigan to establish their tribal courts uh, just from a dream when there was nothing in place. And uh, early on in my experience, I began to realize uh, how destructive the adversarial model of justice that I learned in law school was to relationships to people in our community and uh, people who didn't move away and people who had relationships that extended in uh, a multitude of different directions as neighbors, as co-workers, as relatives, so on and so forth. So it wasn't like we go to the courthouse fight out our battle. Someone's a winner, someone's a loser. We walk away from the courthouse and we disappear and dissolve in a larger society and not see each other again. Here we just live down the road or we work in the next building, so on and so forth. So, uh, and also uh, it was fairly early on that I began to realize I wasn't very effective in the work that I was doing because I would see some of the people coming back. And really what has driven me to uh, explore thinking about native justice principles and ideals and processes was so that I could be effective as a tribal official. Uh, as an Indian person, uh, I'm a member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. And and I live the life that many of our people have lived. And I felt very acutely uh, my entire career, the burden of being effective with the work that I do to try and uh, help people through the trials and tribulations of life. Because life is difficult for almost everyone. And it's really difficult for some of us for a multitude of different reasons. Uh, so I felt that burden very acutely. And, you know, tribal courts, you know, in the English style and the American style are not traditional to our communities. And they're not the way that we, ways that we uh, resolved conflicts and disputes traditionally. So I went to other tribal communities and learned from others uh, and talked to tribal elders and people in our communities about these kind of things. And uh, I've learned a lot from, uh, you know, those travels and those consultations with others about uh, being a native judge in our own community. In fact, one of the things that I would like to share is when I was first asked to become the chief judge for my own tribal community where I served for 16 years, I realized as an Indian person, I was gonna have 
two significant challenges. The first one was respect from within the community because we don't like judges. We don't like prosecutors. We don't like cops. You know, the law has always been used against us. So how do you develop an institution with those kind of agents and players uh, that can be respected by people within the community itself? And then secondly, I know uh, that there would be those who would look in the fishbowl and measure what we were doing by their standards. Are those Indians doing it right? Do they know what they're doing? Are they adequate in the things that they do? And should they have? Should their courts have credibility? So from those days, we've come a long, long way. We've had a lot of allies and partners. Uh, I think this film will be an agent for moving us forward on that journey to uh, have people understand that there's common ground between tribes and uh, those uh, citizens of various states and uh, and also of federal interest. So, you know, these days when I look out, it's changed a lot in 40 years. When I graduated from law school, there were very few Indian attorneys. Uh, over the past 40 years, uh, there have been a lot in my mind that have graduated from law school and gone on to work in different positions. So, you know, I'm encouraged about where we're headed. And I really appreciate the fact that the ABA decided to uh, show this film and uh, to us for us to have a discussion about it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, we will move now to Judge Timothy Connors, who is a current judge at the Washington, Washington wa, wa, County uh, Court uh, Trial Court. Um, and you'll have to correct me on how to say the name. Excuse me. Thank you, Colleen. My name is Timothy Connors, and I'm a state court judge here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm entering my fourth decade. As a judge, I am not native to this continent. I'm Irish, all Irish. A lot of my family is still there. And because they were fishermen, they did not have to be um, evicted. Uh, so a lot of my family still lives in Ireland. And um, I <clears throat> have been privileged as a trial court judge to serve as a circuit court judge um, in the criminal civil division as a family court judge, as a probate court judge, as a district court judge. And the greatest honor I've had as a trial court judge is to serve in a couple of cases with one of our tribal courts where they had a conflict. And they asked me to come in and the, tri and the tribal council asked me to come in. The point of that is that I've seen a wide range of types of conflicts in trial courts in the traditional system. And because of Judge Petoskey and his relationship with one of our Supreme Court justices uh, over now three decades ago, uh, an understanding developed, a respect that developed between our Supreme Court and really Judge Petoskey who started many of our tribal courts here in Michigan. And our Supreme Court developed a tribal state court relationship where, as Justice Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court Justice said to Judge Petoskey and the other tribal judges, we know you know all about us. We know we have a lot to learn from you. My involvement happened well over a decade ago. And it's ironic that today this argument is in front of the United States Supreme Court on ICWA because well over a decade ago, uh, our Supreme Court justice that had this friendship and deep respect with tribal judge, Judge Petoskey, said we are not compliant as state courts and state systems with the Indian Child Welfare Act. And we will not be one of those states that um, deems that to be not only acceptable, but the preferable path. And so the mission was put out to take an honest look why we weren't here in Michigan and what we should do about it. 
in the course of that, I was really lucky. We only, there was only four state court judges on that commission of over 100 people, mostly the tribes, but all the other actors. And the, the directive from our Supreme Court was listen. You listen and then report out. And at the end of the year, I learned a lot. And I learned about uh, why we were having problems and the importance of the Women's Child Welfare Act. And the Supreme Court said, um, you know, I think we need to hear, as we heard here from Indian voices and on Indian land, why this is so important, where it came from. So that started with a whole series of trainings. And I reached out to Judge Petoskey because he was the tribal judge in the area. And uh, I don't know, he heard something of that because he said, yeah, I'll help you. And in the course of that, uh, I started to learn as we're doing the trainings, I said, you know, where this comes from, this, this other, this traditional approach and this worldview of peacemaking, we've missed the ball in our state courts. This is really, we should be doing this as a concurrent ad in our state courts. And our Supreme Court said, go find out about any procedures, or philosophies, or policies that might apply and report back out. And that began the journey. And so I'm talking to you this afternoon from the, actually our trial court here and Judge Petoskey, when we launched this off, came up, sat on this bench right here with me. And these things are all right here. Uh, and so I believe, and our Supreme Court here believes, that peacemaking and restorative justice should be a concurrent path available in our institution, not a deferral, but a concurrent path. And that Judge Petoskey and other tribal judges have been great, tremendous mentors and shared freely with their time and energy. I'm also pleased to report that the institutions of our law schools are beginning to see that value. Um, and I've been lucky enough to teach both traditional trial advocacy, uh, but also because the law schools have agreed and hearing what we're doing here, to peacemaking and restorative justice as a common approach. And so I'm able to teach at the University of Michigan Law School. In fact, we've got students showing up in the courtroom right now for class there, Wayne State Law School and now Vermont Law School. So that's the background, but I'm the first to tell you that we owe everything that any steps we've taken as allies um, from our tribal courts and that continues to be a great source of research. Thank you, Judge Connors. Um, last me, last me, I, uh, lastly, I'm my name is Colleen Lamar. Um, I am the former immediate, I am the immediate past president of the National Native American Bar Association and have the pleasure of um, sitting as a special advisor to the um, Native American Concerns Committee of the uh, Civil Rights and Social Justice Section. Um, I am Mohawk, and that's my connection to kind of this this panel and discussion, although I do not practice traditional Indian law. So um, I am always thrilled and excited to see uh, movements such as, uh, you know, what Judge Connors discussed of, of moving the idea of peacemaking into the state courts beyond just the tribes and, and just beyond Indian people. And I find that really exciting that we're doing that because, um, you know, it, 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 it also hasn't even been used forever within the, the 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 tribal court systems this was you know a, a construct that was uh, more likely used um kind of prior more often used prior to the development of of sort of the the western idea of a, a court system um you know one of the things that i found really interesting from the documentary and actually something that judge petusky just mentioned in, in his introductory remarks was in some ways the <clears throat> the issue of the repeat player problem being something that, um, you know, comes from economics where you're going to see the people again. And so we invest in relationships and solving problems, perhaps in a different way. If we understand that, you know, we're going to have a, a repeat game with people. Um, and I think um, Judge Petoskey, you, you mentioned kind of that being in a more traditional way, one of the, the, the kind of driving points behind um, some of the traditional peacemaking that you've brought into the court. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that. 
kind of the holistic, I, when I think of it, I think of it as the holistic approach. And you know, we could think of it as restorative justice, um, not just locking somebody up, throwing away the key, but restoring them as a human being to come back in the criminal sense, but um, also coming into how businesses interact with each other. Well, you know, after I had been a travel judge for a handful of years, we would get invited to uh, uh, the conferences uh, the state would hold for its judges, the Probate Judges Association, the Circuit Court Judges Association, so on and so forth. And it was because there was an interest, they had an interest in the Indian Child Welfare Act and because I, I'm an Indian person and maybe a tribal judge, they thought I knew something about the Indian Child Welfare Act. And my response was, well, that's a federal statute. It applies to the work you do, not the work I do. Because back at home, our tribe has its own child protection code uh, that might be similar to yours, uh, but there are going to be some differences in terms of uh, the process and how we engage in people and the standards uh, that we apply. But to me, you know, when I when I met with these judges, they'd ask me, they'd lean across the table and they'd say, what's your recidivism like? And I would look at them and I'd, recidivism. Uh, to me, that didn't make any sense at all because, you know, uh, we don't have one-time contact with the people who come to our court. They're members of the community. So uh, we have lifelong contact with each other in a whole variety of different contexts. And, uh, you know, one of those is uh, as a judge and someone who's before the court, but it's not like we're gonna fix them. They're gonna go away. They're gonna be all right. So I think the contact that we have, the concern that we have is, is lifelong, it's ongoing, and it's more of a matter of, it's not an economic matter at all. It's about treating others as a human being and thinking about them as a human being. And like I said earlier, helping them through the uh, uh, challenges of life and uh, and uh everything that life might bring in terms of uh, of hardship. Uh, we all need to hang together and help each other out. I mean, the creator would have us do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's great. And I'm I'm kind of wondering, Audrey, from your perspective as a as a film, you know, as the as writing this documentary, from I think it's the third wall, right? Is that the expression within the film, kind of the on the outside, kind of looking in and trying to report in what you're seeing? Um, after having done an immense amount of research on this to know that it would be something that that should be reported on, but the way that you phrased the documentary had the historical discussion of some some um well, they're not all historical, but some some uh, things that might impact where we are today in Indian country um, and how that's driven kind of this this movement toward the peacemaking process um, in the courts um, from from the kind of the lawyer aspect. And, it, you know, what's interesting about this is there's a discussion, of course, of of, um, you know, Indian country from the perspective of non lawyers, but you were looking at this through the lens of lawyers, which is even more of a subset, right? I, I agree yes. that we do have more native lawyers in in the in the country now, certainly than 40 years ago. But you know, I was one of of three in my law school class, so um, you know, there still aren't enough. We we are still not represented completely. But I, I'm wondering, Audrey, kind of what you what you were thinking, kind of as you built that that stage from um discussing about you know discussing the violence against women act discussing the indian child welfare act um and boarding schools and setting that stage as to how we got to where we are i guess that's a, a great question um <clears throat> i guess to begin with just to give you a little background on how i even got involved with this this particular topic of of lawyers uh, attorneys and tribal judges and and judges such as um uh 
Judge Connors, who are, is involved in peacemaking. Um, I, I was introduced to um, the Volcker Foundation, which uh, Judge Petoskey is involved with. Um, they are located in right now uh, in Marquette, Michigan, but um, they have a, um, a, uh, a Native American um, attorney um, uh, legal scholarship program whereby they help um, um, attorneys, uh, people that Native Americans that are trying to get their degree in law school and help them out financially. Uh, and I was, of course, very aware that this is a you know very small population, even though it's wonderful to hear that it is expanding, but it is still um, uh, you know a very small group. And then that was partly my appeal, the appeal to me, because you you just don't hear about the work of um, Native American attorneys and judges and their colleagues. And, um, it, but it, it struck me how critical they are to um, everything that's going on in um, Native communities. And um, I mean, there's, you know, I, I presented the topics as an overview because um, I felt I needed not only to give this basic backdrop of what, what they do and, and, and how that has come to be, um, but it, it touches upon all the different areas that, that they can be involved with, um, especially when they work for tribal communities or with Native American law. Um, and it, of course, all of that um, leads to today. It's all affecting what is happening in contemporary Indian country. And, you know, I just was, the more I researched, the more I interviewed, the more, um, you know, of course, I realized how important the law is to native communities, how central it is, because it's been so much part of the past. It's been abused and misused and used against Native Americans and Native communities. So um, although it seems like kind of a, you know, like how did you come up with that? It's so unusual. It's so, you know, it's 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 a niche, a real niche, but it it it's um it affects every, I think in so many aspects of native communities and and also um, um non-native people to understand um, just how all of this is, is still present today and how it does even affect them and our relationships with tribal communities. So that's kind of where I was coming from. Yeah, that, that's really great background, Audrey. And, um, you know, I thought it was, it was particularly interesting to see the, the story through the eyes of, you know, somebody who is definitely an ally, but also who, somebody who's not Native American and, and, and mm -hmm. telling that story of, of how did, how did we get where we are? So, um, thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you for that. Pleasure. Um, you know, I, I think in, in looking at the list of participants who we have on the line with us, you know, I, I am thrilled that we have so many people interested and, um, within the greater ABA who are Native as well as not Native, and I'm wondering um, to our two judges, if, if, if both of you can speak a little bit to the peacemaking process and what that what that actually means. Right. We we talk about it because, you know, as interested, self-selected people, we have some idea, but it also means different things, different places. So maybe we can give a little bit of an overview as to what's intended by peacemaking. Well, you're exactly right. Uh, peacemaking can mean different things to different people. And when people start talking about peacemaking, I listen very carefully so I can hear exactly uh, what their perspective is or, or, or how they're seeing things. Um, and peacemaking in our Pokagon Band Potawatomi community really consists of, I would say, a couple of things primarily. Um, but those couple of things could involve a lot of different other things. One is we have uh, community-based uh, peace circles that can be ducted by community members who are volunteers from the community. They're not associated with the court who facilitate people uh, to resolution when they're in conflicts or disputes. So it's a conflict resolution tool that's available uh, where uh, people don't have to come to the court 
or conflicts or disputes. And some communities are very litigious that I've worked in and others not so much so. Uh, Pokagans, uh, for me as a tribal judge, is kind of a relief. They're, they're not overly litigious in terms of wanting to resolve problems because it was common for them to do this before they had a court, to sit on a circle and talk things through. They themselves talking about the issue, what's going on, and coming to a resolution. So it was not this strange alien thing when the court talked about maybe uh, supporting the community to uh, develop a process that they could conduct peace circles. But Tim and I have a colleague that we dearly love who, who commonly talks about peacemaking from the bench. And that is when people are formally in the court, treating people with dignity, knowing how to uh, let them know you were there to help. And uh, you know, one of the things that I have done for a number of years in my child protection cases and other cases uh, is to sit down with the people before hearing around a circular table to talk about what's going on. What are the issues? What are the concerns? What are the needs? What are the barriers? How can we work together to help both a mother and father and children who might be before the court in a child protection matter? And it's a lot different experience for the attorneys than they have when they go to state court. Because I'll spend as much time back in chambers uh, identifying issues and problem solving as we do when we go into court, the courtroom itself, and uh, and go on the record. So, uh, and one of the other things that I would share is even in the formal court setting, uh, one of our presenting officers shared with me a few years back that she was preparing a new uh state service worker uh in the department of social services who was involved in one of her cases who had never been to a tribal court before she said so i sat down with her to prepare her a bit uh for what might happen when she comes to tribal court and she said one of the things i told her is don't be surprised if the judge looks down at the parents either one of them or both of them and says, we love you. What is it we can do to help you? Tell me, we're here to help you. I can't read your mind. Tell me what you're thinking, what it is you need from us because we want you to be successful. That is our obligation as tribal officials that's an obligation that we have that extends from the creator. The creator would want us to be this kind of person who's engaging people and listening to them and engaging in real problem solving and, and moving people to, you know, this place of healing, reconciliation, and living the kind of life the creator would have them live. You know, it's kind of interesting to me, you know, having been an attorney for 40 years, I see things come into vogue in justice systems and a few years down the road, something else is in vogue. You know, right now, uh, restorative justice is all the topic people are talking about. And peacemaking is not, re not restorative justice, but it's a cousin. To peacemaking, and I think peacemaking goes much further in the way it uh, uh, deals with matters, and uh, it's transformative. In addition to being, uh, you know, restorative, and there are other things that are really different about it. But uh, you know. I'm 75, and when I look in my rearview mirror, I see a lot of things. 
And one of those things that I see is it wasn't really until the mid 90s where in the state of Michigan, they even began thinking about alternative dispute resolution, they called it. And then later, as we get further down the road, and I continue to look into my rear view mirror, I see a whole array of specialty courts emerging. First, it was drug courts, now they're veterans courts, mental health courts, therapeutic courts, uh, restorative justice initiatives. Uh, and we could do quite a laundry list of what exists out there these days. But I think uh, those in dominant society have found that courts that can focus on identifying issues and resolving those issues that really matter and problem solving and consensus resolution are a whole lot more effective than what was going on before. And now Ju Judge Connors has a lot of thoughts about this. Thanks, Judge. I think um, in interest of time, let me give you one example. We have applied the difference in every type of case in the trial, state trial court, including adult criminal case. Um, but let me give you one example that, um, that might highlight for you of how it might look that's different. That would be in child custody cases. And traditionally, we've in, our, in the adversarial system or our state system in child custody, we have 12 factors that the legislature articulates, and each side gets up and tries to promote how they're so much better under that factor and how bad the other side is. But they each get the opportunity to tear down the other side. And at the end of it, one of the things I learned from Judge uh, Petoskey is he looked at a couple that was doing that in his court and said, you know, you're so articulate and effective, you've got me convinced neither of you are any good. I think I got to call the state to come in and raise your children. They still looked at each other and said, Judge, can we have a few minutes? And they worked it out. The point is that there is a word that Judge Petoskey taught us. And he said, you know, uh, where we are, where our land is located here, and that we sit on the Potawatomi, said there's no actual word for child. So we call it child custody in our language. The closest is a word called note. Note. And the literal translation is young spirit coming forth. You see, we immediately, this exemplifies the change in dynamic as a child being a piece of property that parents fight over and stand, whether they have exclusive jurisdiction or shared you know, property interest, um, and instead talks about responsibility that adults have towards protecting, nurturing, developing, loving that child. It completely shifts the paradigm. How would that look in practice? When we have a child custody hearing and peacemaking, rather than, first of all, in our traditional system, grandparents aren't allowed or neighbors aren't allowed necessarily, unless that they're here to testify against or for one side. But instead, we would sit in circle and everybody who that child has a connection to in a potentially positive way could be part of the circle. And we would start it with them bringing a picture of the child and talking about why they brought that picture and what makes them, what's the connection that they have. Now, in going around, everybody's hearing about this common ground of caring and loving this child. And we've replaced a child custody hearing of fear, of disconnect, with inclusion. And then we come back and start to say, what does this child need from you? What can you bring? the table for this child completely changes the paradigm so this would be an example i think colleen of how the same issue but the approach uh is is, is very different and the results become very different. well that's very i think that's very helpful and and kind of understanding both within you know native tribal communities as well as in um you know, the, the non-tribal justice system, 
how peacemaking can play out. Both Judge Podowski as well as Judge Connors referenced sitting in a circle or circle. And I'm hoping that one of you will discuss a little bit what you mean about that, because to me, it's quite familiar. But I um, I realize that that the significance of that, there is real significance. And I, I'm wanting to highlight that for our for our, our audience. Well, the, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned this. And I'm smiling because after 19 years, uh, the Pokagon Band was able to build a new court building. and. Uh, in meeting with the design people before it was built and part of that process, I basically had two things on my wish wish list. One was a circular courtroom because I understood the power of people sitting on the circle and it's designed such that everyone is on a circle. And we figured out how we can even have a, a jury set on the circle. Uh, when we have jury trials. Uh, it's a beautiful facility. The second thing that was on my wish list was a circular healing fire room where we could actually build a live fire on Mother Earth and have our peace circles uh, have a space for them to be conducted along with that space being available to the uh, pipe carriers and the uh, other folks in the community who might uh, want to use that. In fact, it turned out with two, with a circular courtroom and another circle within the building, uh, and you try to put square blocks or rectangular shaped rooms for the other rooms that we needed for conferencing, attorney-client meeting rooms, a workspace for staff. They didn't fit very well. So they ended up building, into, the entire building is circular uh, because in that Pottawatomie community, they really believe in the power of circle. Uh, and we use the circle for many things within, within our culture. Uh, but for us in a justice system, bringing people together and uh, uh, having them be on a circle where there's equality, where everyone has an opportunity to say what they would like to say. Circle also requires those who are not talking to listen. And even though we sometimes talk about our talking circles, they're really, they're, they're more about listening, others on the circle listening to the person who is uh, who is talking. Um, all of our tables in our new facility are circular, so that when we have meetings or we uh, are collaborating on different kinds of work products, everyone sits on the circle. So the circle really has. Uh, quite a significance. And on our circular building, when people drive up in the parking lot, uh, it says travel court and peacemaking center. One of the journeys that we have been involved in, that I've been involved in, in each of the five very different travel communities that I've worked in is uh, community folks are regaining culture. People are learning the language. Uh, we're rebuilding from decade after decade after decade of dispossession and uh, our culture being decimated uh, by what has happened historically. And one of the things I really like about this film is I think it provides that context very well and uh, exposes a whole mirror of different kind of issues uh, tribal communities are facing. And another thing that it occurred to me as people were talking today is uh, the voices that you're hearing are the voices of people who are working in the trenches, people who are actually doing the hard work. And uh, that's how I've described myself uh, over the years is, I'm a person who uh, likes to toil in the trenches uh, and, and have done 
you know, that hard work in each of the tribal communities uh, where I've worked. And even though my career is, I can see the sunset, um, it's been very meaningful. And I share it with every young Indian attorney that I can when I have the opportunity to speak because it's been very meaningful and it's been extremely self-satisfying -satisf as an Indian person to me. Thank you so much for sharing that that part of yourself with us. Um, I, I just I found the the circle reference being used so symbolically very helpful, showing that each member in the courtroom is a contributor, right, um, and is a is a is a is an active party to to um, solving the problem that, that's that been raised. I, I just found that very helpful. We have a question from one of our attendees and I'll summarize that question to be, we talk about the peacemaking process in the Indian community. We talk about, you know, from, from Judge Connors bringing the peacemaking process into um, the United States or the state uh, justice system. You know, we're in Native American Heritage Month, and 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 in leading up to this call, I I thanked our judges and and Audrey for all of the work that they've done to bring back the pride in in being Native American. We we talked a little bit about this issue of, um, you know, the the role of Indian boarding schools and and how they've really affected pretty much every native person or first nations person um, that's living today has been impacted in some way or another, either they're the child of someone who went or the child of someone who didn't go and who was traumatized either way. Um, and it's taken a lot to become proud of being indigenous, proud of being a native American again. Um, but there still are some setbacks and some disappointments. And one of our attendees has raised one of those and that is okay we can we, we can move toward peacemaking here and 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 then in you know the u.s the u.s judicial system but how do we get it to work to preserve the rights of native americans when they are being stomped on by the u.s government or by state government or by corporations or whatever it might be how do we bring that into the process that we that we use to resolve disputes <clears throat> or enter into contracts quite frankly because uh, as a non-litigator I think that's also equally as important as how we interact with with um, the other contracting side how do we bring that in to um to protect us this is a hard question so <laughs> and, and it's it's fair game for for Audrey for uh, Judge Connors, D Judge Potowski, anybody who has ideas on this, I'd love to hear them. Well, I know I'd be surprised if Judge Connors doesn't have some ideas of how this concept applies uh, more broadly. But, you know, I think of an, an, an a, uh, well, I don't even know if it's an analogy. It may be a metaphor. I got to go to Google to figure it out. But, you know, we're in a canoe. I've always felt like us Indian people, uh, no matter what the current threat is, uh, what future threats might be, um, we've suffered a lot. We've been through a lot. Times have been hard before. We know how to survive hard times. It's like we're in a canoe and we're going downstream and uh, there's only so much within our control. A lot of what happens to that canoe is uh, by outside forces. And as Indian people, as tribes, we know that. We felt that before. Uh, so as we paddle our canoe downstream, uh, it may be that we're going to hit some rapids. How bad they might be, we don't know. But I do know this. We're going to survive. We survived before, and we will do what we can to manage our own canoe, and we will do it uh, in a good way, a way that uh, we can stand tall 
in terms of who we are as Native people and uh, and uh, our obligations to the Creator. So, you know, I don't worry too much about the future. I'm not a worrier. You know, uh, I have to deal with what's on my plate today and then maybe what's on the plate tomorrow, next week, one week at a time, one month at a time, one year at a time. Uh, but we're going to we're going to get through this. Uh, you know, I don't think we need to throw down the towel and say, oh, woe is me. Woe is us. Uh, we've been treated very poorly. And I think that that in the past, and that's an extreme understatement. Uh, we have many good people who continue to do the hard work in various places. We're going to be all right going forward. So that was a great way to start the conclusion of our program. And I generally agree. I think we're we're strong people and um, provided that we continue to act with heart um, in all that we do, we're we're on the right path. What can the folks on this call do to get involved, um, either in the peacemaking process or to learn more, um, both in tribal courts, but also, um, you know, Judge Connors, you're you're bringing this into the business court realm. I, I just Let's offer some resources for folks to adopt some of these principles in their practices. I mean, are you are you talking to me? I'm I'm opening the question up, but I do think you have some great answers. <laughs> I just want to follow up in in answering that with what Mike said, what Judge Kapowski said, and his analogy or metaphor was simile uh, in the canoe. I'd like to offer another perspective, which I think is consistent then leading into this question. And that is, uh, I, I have both relatives and good friends that have been declared clinically dead and come back. And the combination and the consistency of what they experience, and there's a big article out now in the science that what's happening and that this is documented. And that is that out-of-body experience. And I say this because when that happens, everybody, they come out and they see themselves as just, you know, the, the connection. And instead of the me inside my body, it's the we. And they suddenly realize we're just uh, on this same little spaceship, terribly vulnerable, Mother Earth, hurtling through space. We need each other. And as allies, it's simply the recognition that peacemaking is that we are all connected. We are all vulnerable. It is we, not me. So what people can do is in, you really, I, I, it starts with Michael Jackson's, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look in the mirror and make a change. It starts from within and how you approach your life and your interactions with everyone wherever you go and whatever institution you live in or work in, you start to say, hey, how about trying this in this other way? And we are allies together. Um, and that's where it can start. So you can Google things, you can find out things. There are movements around. I'm speaking later next week to the Irish Mediation Society, my relatives over there because they're excited about all this that's happening. There's peacemaking work being done around the world and in various communities. But I mean it, you start from within. And you and, and, I, you know. and I would share this, the Native American Rights Fund has an indigenous uh, justice initiative website page. They have done work with other tribes and uh, have gathered resources together uh, so that others could access that kind of information. And and I and I guess the last thing I'd like to say is uh, this is not something new, uh, and this is not something only Pokagon Band or Washtenaw County Court does. You look at indigenous people around the world and uh, 
these practices, these values, these ideals, these principles uh, exist universally. Well, it's two two o'clock in California. Um, I'm sitting on the unceded territory of the Ohlone people, by the way. Um, and I want to thank everyone for for joining us. Um, thank you to our judges. Thank you to Audrey. Um, thank you to the Civil Rights and Social Justice section for hosting this webinar. It's discussions like these that, to President Ross's point, to me, make being an ABA member worthwhile and helpful. And I hope that for those who joined us on the panel, as well as for our attendees, um, this this gave you some insight and something to think about. Um, the social rights, the section of civil rights and social justice does provide these pre, free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. Um, and we hope this that this helps you in your work. Um, please continue joining the ABA. Um, you can do so at ABA, sorry, excuse me, at um, ambar.org, CRSJ, and that's the, that's the, uh, the website for the section. Um, to everyone, best of luck in your work today and 